Well, good morning and welcome. Welcome to all of you online. Uh, we are going to continue with the Big Ten series. These are the big things, the top things in the Bible that everybody should know. Some of us, or some of you, might have heard these stories as kids in Sunday school, if you were raised in the church. I was not raised in the church, so all of these stories are not new to me now, but they were new to me as an adult, and I thought, wow, that really happened. Oh my, look at that. How did that go on? It's pretty neat when we think about the miracles that God has done throughout the course of our lives and the lives of others. Today, we're going to talk about the parting of the Red Sea, but in order to do that, I need to give you a little background about the leader of the people that took the people out of Egypt to the Promised Land. So I'm going to give you a brief overview. Moses. Moses was their leader. Moses was a Jew who was born during the time when all firstborn Jewish kids, males, were to be killed. And the reason for that is they were in G Egypt, and the population of the Israelites were growing. See, they were foreigners in Egypt. That was not their homeland. They were foreigners there. But the king and the pharaohs of Egypt said, oh my, this, these, these Israelites, there's a lot of them. Maybe we should kill the firstborn for a while. Well, Moses was one of those. Well, the mother, he was born, she put him into a little uh, basket and it went down the Nile River. Well, Pharaoh's daughter found the basket and raised Moses as an Egyptian in Pharaoh's home, which was, you know, pretty luxurious, pretty nice place to be. But then as he got older, he realized, you know, I'm not an Egyptian. I'm a Jew. My people are the Jewish people who are now the slaves of the Egyptians. For 400 years, the Israelites were slaves to the Egyptians. Well, Moses... He sees one of his fellow Israelites being beaten. He jumps in, ends up killing this Egyptian guard, ends up leaving town. He becomes a sheep herder, a, a, a farmer, a raiser of cattle out in the desert. Anyway, he's walking along one day, and there is a bush that is burning. Now we've heard this story too. See, there's a number of different things in this story of Exodus that we have heard about. The burning bush that doesn't burn, that speaks to Moses. It's God speaking to Moses from this burning bush. We've heard about this burning bush. It's in Exodus. It's in this book of the Bible. Moses goes over to him, God speaking to him, tells him, you're going to lead the people, your people, my children, out of Egypt. You're going to lead them to the promised land. Moses says, I don't think so. But thanks for stopping by and put that fire out. Because I'm not going to do it. Because I'm not a leader. And that song we just sang talks about miracles that God does. See, Moses was not a leader. He wasn't good at anything, quite frankly. But what God said was basically... You know, yeah, yeah, you're right, Moses. You aren't that good. But if I call you to do something, I'll make you good. I'll give you what you need to be good. Long story short, Moses says, okay. So God tells him he needs to go to Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh to let the people go. Let the Israelites go to the promised land. 400 years they've been slaves. So he goes to Pharaoh. He knows Pharaoh. He goes to Pharaoh and says, hey, Pharaoh, buddy, 
need to let our people go, my people. Pharaoh said, nah, it's not going to happen, sport. Ain't going to happen. But thanks for stopping by. Appreciate it. Moses goes back to God and says, no, nah, he's not going to do it. Have you heard of the ten plagues? You've heard of that in the Bible, right? It's in this book, too. Here's another miracle that happened. So God says to Pharaoh, or to Moses, go to Pharaoh and tell him if he doesn't do this, I'm going to send you ants and gnats and, and frogs, and I'm going to turn the Red Sea or into blood, the Nile into blood. You know, all that, the water is going to be blood. So all these plagues happen. To come the 10th plague, Pharaoh says, okay, I got it. I got it. I'm going to let the people go. Okay. So Moses says, fine. So off he goes with the Israelites to the promised land. Well, how many of these Israelites do you think there were? Now, they have been 400 years as slaves in Egypt. So how many do you think there were of these people leaving Egypt? Well, in verse 12, chapter 12 of the Bible, it says there were 600,000 of them. 600,000 men. Plus, there are women and children. There could be four million people. Moses is leading four million people out of Egypt to the promised land. For a guy that couldn't talk very well, wasn't much of a leader, four million people, that's a pretty good start. So off he goes. And they're following him gets to a point where Pharaoh realizes this, this is not working out well. I just let all of our slaves go. Who's, go, who's going to build the houses? Who's going to tend to the crops? Who's going to tend to the sheep? Pharaoh has second thoughts. Okay, this is not going to work out. We're going to go and get our slaves, and if they don't want to come back, we're going to kill them. So that's where we are. Now, if you turn or open your Bibles or your phone apps, let's go to Exodus 14, chapter 10. And I'm going to read this to you. As Pharaoh drew near, this is the Pharaoh's army draws near. The sons of Israel looked and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them. Oh, my. And they became very frightened. So the son of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, and I love this. Is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? Stop right there. So here they are. They got an attitude, don't they? These, these Israelites have an attitude. So what they're saying, uh, Moses... We couldn't get buried there. There wasn't enough ground in Egypt to bury us. You brought us out here. A little arrogant. A little arrogant. Got a little attitude. Then they say, Why have you dealt with us this way? bringing us out of Egypt. Wait a minute, for 400 years you've been slaves, and now you're saying, I brought you out? Wait a minute, there's 4 million people walking behind me. Oh, this was just a passing thought? 400 years they've been praying to God. Get somebody over here to get us out of here. But now that they've got somebody, and the going's going to get a little tough, they're going to tell him, Moses, I want to go back to Egypt. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'm thinking to myself, hmm, that's kind of like me. You know, we have a tendency to look at the past as being rosy. We look at the past as everything was great then. 
We have a way of taking all the bad things in our life and stuffing them down and looking at all the neat things in our past. We compartmentalize these things and we forget about the tough times we had, how we were in bondage, that something was restricting us from moving on. In the case of the Egyptians, they were slaves. And they had guards over there making sure that they did the work that they were supposed to do as slaves. Sometimes our past, we were in slavery. Something kept us from moving forward. It could have been an addiction. It could have been a financial issue. It could have been a relational issue, but it kept us from moving forward. And we have a tendency to regress back to the way we were. Sometimes it could be our sinful nature. The Egyptians are saying, hey, we want to go back. We're, we're, we're not going to go any farther. We've got the Red Sea in front of us. We got Pharaoh's army behind us. We're going to either die or go back to slavery. We don't want to do it. It would be better for us to serve as Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. Then we see in 13, but Moses said to the people, do not fear, stand still by the sea of salvation and the Lord, he will accomplish for you today. Today. Moses is saying, he will accomplish for you today. So just hang out for a little bit longer, and you're going to see a miracle. Moses knows this. See, sometimes we go up against things, and we think there's no way out. We're between a rock and a hard spot, and there's no way out. And we seem to be looking this way rather than this way. All of a sudden, when the going gets tough, sometimes the tough don't get going. Sometimes they sit, and it becomes a pity party. That's what's happened to the Egyptians. They're in a pity party. Things aren't going our way. I don't like this. This is not going to work out well. They trusted God to get them out, but they aren't trusting God to get them to the promised land. You see, I'll give you this, God, but I'm going to keep this. It doesn't work that way. You give God all of it, and he will give you all that you need. See, God could have taken the Egyptians a different way, a much shorter way. They could have gone through Palestine. The Palestinians were a warring people. They were equipped with spears and and whatever else they had, and swords, and they were fearless. And they would have killed those Israelites. But God took them the long way to the Red Sea. Why? Because a miracle was going to happen, and he wanted that miracle to happen, and he wanted everybody, all the Israelites, to see that miracle happen. Because he wanted them to love him as much as he loves them. So here we are. They are at the Red Sea. Army is coming down on them. Things look tough. He tells Moses, Moses, listen to me. I need you to raise your hand over the sea. And Moses raises his hand over the sea and the Red Sea, and it parts. By the way, the Red Sea isn't red. The red Sea is not red. It was the way that the sun reflected across the mountains that made the sea look red. It actually wasn't red. A little FYI, make a little note there. Red Sea, not red. <laughs> Blue, big mountain. 
parts the Red Sea. Now, let's talk about the parting of the Red Sea. This was not a creek. This was where they figured this happened. And they had archaeologists and diving explorers have found chariots. They have found bones. They have found wheels. They have found swords. They've found a lot of stuff indicating what's going to happen to the Egyptians. I got ahead of myself a little bit. But anyway, this is about 12 miles across and about 250 feet deep. So this is not just a little, you know, bed of water. This is serious. Boom. Moses parts the sea. All of the Israelites were able to cross on dry land. And the scripture is very descriptive how the wind was blowing and the waves were going up and it all parted. How do you think the Israelites are feeling right now? Feeling good. Feeling good. Let's go. So they go across to the other side. Israelites are very happy at this point, aren't they? They were a little sour to begin with, a little arrogant to begin with, a little down to begin with, but now they're on the other side. What has God done? What has God done? He has said, if you trust in me, you will survive. You've been praying for 400 years. I heard your prayers. Although he got a little cranky here, I'll forgive you because I'm a forgiving God. But I'm telling you, you need to listen to me in the future. You need to listen to Moses. You need to follow Moses. And they're saying, yes, Jesus. So here comes the Egyptians. Scripture is very, it says, you will see these Egyptians no more. That's what he says to the Israelites. And sure enough, the only time they saw them when they were dead. Because he Egyptians started coming through that opening of the Red Sea. And once they all got in there, the chariots, the horses, the army, every, the soldier, boom, here comes the water back. And it becomes still. And the Egyptian scripture tells us on the other side, we're looking at the dead bodies. A miracle. A miracle. I think Charleston Heston played Moses. Yeah. Miracle. So they're off. They're off to the promised land. Moses says to them, we need to move forward. We need to keep going. You know, we say often in our lives, it's impossible. That sea's not going to part for us. It's impossible. We got our backs up against the wall. It's impossible. God says all things are possible. Matthew 19, 25. He says all things are possible. We say I'm too tired. God says, no, no, no. I will give you rest. Again, Matthew. We say, no one really loves me. God says, I love you, John 3, 16. God so loved the world. We say, nobody really cares about me. God says, I care about you. First Peter. There's a story, and as I wrap this up, I want to tell you a story about a mule. We're digressing a little bit. But a mule, this farmer's mule, falls into a well. Farmer tries and tries and tries to get this mule out of this well and to no avail. And sadly, he says to his two sons, I can't get this mule out of this hole out of this well. I can't. I can't. We're just going to have to fill the well in. So they throw in a shovel of dirt, hits the mule, mule shakes it off, spits, coughs. 
They keep throwing dirt onto this mule. The mule starts stomping. He starts stomping. So they bring a truck in. They drop a load of dirt in. He keeps stomping. He keeps stomping. Then they bring another trunk, truck of dirt in. He keeps stomping. He keeps stomping. You know what happened to that mule? He eventually stomped his way out of the well. Because he wouldn't stop. He wouldn't stop. No matter how bad it looked, he would not stop stomping. And he stopped his way all the way up to the top. Walked out of that well, shook it off. So I'm good to go. What do we got? That's what we need to do. We need to shake it off. We need to stomp and stomp and stomp till God hears us and God answers our prayers and he will answer your prayers. If you think that he won't, you are wrong and I'm going to tell you that you're wrong. What is your well today? What is it in your life that you've not let go, that you haven't given to God that you're down at the bottom of the well looking up. What have you got? What do you got in your life that you need to start stomping on and start trusting in God to get you out of it? Many of us say, if, if God loved me, he would have done this. He would have solved these problems. He would have taken my financial issues away. He would have got me into a better relationship. My health would have been better. If God loved me, he would have done this. That's a very childish way of thinking. God doesn't work like this. The opposite is true. If God loves you, he will reveal himself to you in a way that you can grab a hold of it and make a difference in your life yourself. Because he'll give you the tools. We go right back to where we started. Right where we started. If God calls you to do something, he will equip you. He will equip you. He'll give you the ability to stomp and stomp and stomp until you get out of the situation you are in. Regardless of what it is. Don't give up. Don't be like the Israelites either saying, why did you get me into this mess? Don't blame other people. If you got yourself into the mess, get yourself out of the mess. Stand on your own two feet. Stomp yourself out of the mess. And you will find, at the end of the day, your relationship with our Heavenly Father will be a heck of a lot better than it was when you were at the bottom of the well. Because he got you out. Let's pray. Father God, I don't know how many times I've been at the bottom of the well. I don't know how many times I felt I couldn't get myself out. And for many years, it wasn't 400 years, but it was a lot of years, I was at that bottom of the well. And it was only when I was at the very, very lowest point in my life did I look up and I saw the dirt coming and I started stomping. And today, I walk around glorifying you and all that I say and all that I do. And I know that people here within the sound of my voice can do the same thing because I'm not special. You called me to be a pastor. I was so far from being a pastor but yet you equipped me, you equipped me, you gave me the ability to do the things that I never thought I could do, never even dreamed about doing. And there's people here today that are in the same place I was. And I pray that you touch their hearts and minds and give them the ability to continue to stomp and look up from the bottom of the well, knowing that one day you'll get them out. And in doing so, you will make them better, and they will love you more. Just like those Israelites loved you when they crossed 
at Red Sea. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all that have come. I ask that you bless each and every one of them. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Thank you for all of you online. God bless you and have a wonderful coming week. And remember- Hey, thank you so much for tuning in today. My name is Richie Griffith, and I am the lead pastor and founding here at Movement Church, Tip City, Ohio. Uh, And this ministry is made possible through your generosity. And that's right, to continue supporting the movement, uh, you can give at the movementchurch.community. That's movementchurch.community. But you need to also make sure that you follow us on social media at the movement 937. Be sure to hit subscribe and don't forget to hit that notifications bell. Thank you so much for listening today and God bless you.